Jingi walla blagami a rakul dugum. Gender mani nyali garaman nyali nya. Nyali nya nyathan nyathan jem. Garaman nyali jugun gunu. Wana jang ma mala gunu. Gala jugun. Nyali nya jugun gunu. Bugu be blagami. Hi, I'm Sunil Badami and welcome to the Byron Writers Festival Digital School Sessions. Now today, we're not in sunny Byron, we're in the Martian Embassy in the Story Factory in Sydney's Redfern. Today, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. I acknowledge and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Does this guy need any introduction? Award-winning comedian, Triple J Brecky host, actor, writer, co-creator of his own show, The Other Guy on Stand, and now published author. I'd like you to welcome the wonderful Matt O'Keen. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, but don't worry about it. Let's go. Keep going, keep going. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad you took that so okay. <laughs> I brought you some chicken and chips oh, in honour of your book. How good is this? See, get yourself a job where you can eat chips as you work. Like in a chicken shop? <laughs> well, yeah, but also there are other places to do that. Like here, yeah, eating chips. I mean, they got chicken salt on them. Thank you very much. So you're a chicken salt guy? Who isn't? Me. <laughs> get out. And I like to put mayonnaise you can, on my chips. You can get my name wrong as much as you want, but as soon as you start offending chicken salt, you start walking. So tell me, what is being black and chicken and chips all about? Um, look, it's about a 12-year-old boy who's trying to start high school and trying to fit in with, the, with everyone else, trying to get into sports team, trying to figure out his, uh, what love is. Um, all while his mum is dying of cancer. So it's a coming of age story. Uh, it's semi-fictional, it's based on elements of my life uh, and events that have happened to me, you know, in, in particular my mum passing away from cancer when I was 12. Um, but it's also just a ridiculous look at puberty, at teenage lust, at, um, you know, just wanting to fit in. It's, it's about wanting to get the internet, you know, it's set in 1998 and all my character wants is to get the internet at home. Um, so for any kids out there who don't know a life without internet, there was a time when it was the coolest thing and most exciting thing in the world. And you know, you begged your parents to get it installed. Kind of like your great grandparents wanting electricity. <laughs> yeah, you know, the family sitting around watching, uh, listening to the wireless, you know, at night. Instead, when I was growing up, it was the family sitting around watching a single picture load that quickly on the dial-up. So you've written about or talked about the experience of your mum's death in your award-winning show, Being Black and Chicken and <clears throat> Yes. Why did you choose to fictionalise that story in being black and chicken and chips? To be completely honest, um, because I felt like you, there would be more chance of making a film out of it. Um, I don't think memoirs are that are as interesting. I mean, and then I don't think the, that memoirs have the longevity that telling a, that just telling a story that's universal does. So um, I think it relies on me too much then, people needing to know who I am and people needing to understand all these other parts of, um, you know, the things that I do and, and, and my career and stuff, you know, whereas to be able to just tell a story about a boy whose mum is dying of cancer, I feel like means that anyone can pick it up no matter what language they speak, no matter where they're from or whatever, they can pick it up. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter the jobs, I've, whether I've worked on the radio or on TV or anything. It's just they can connect with this story. So that's what I, that's what I really did it for. But, I mean, you know, as you mentioned, it's semi-autobiographical. There's a young guy whose um, mum is dying of cancer, whose dad comes from Ghana, who grows up in a kind of suburb very similar to, you know, 
somewhere in Queensland. <laughs> yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. You're, uh, you're ticking a lot of the, uh, the truth boxes here. Yeah, um, and I guess those are, the, those are the parts of my upbringing that I found the most unique and the most interesting. You know, certainly back in, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, there, there wasn't that many um, African kids where I went to school or anything like that. That was a big point of difference. My dad was doing really exciting things, running African nightclubs in a time when there wasn't that many, you know, African nightclubs, certainly around Brisbane. And, and then, of course, the main event of, of the, of a, you know, a, a parent passing, that's something that is so... I mean, it's the pinnacle kind of, or the most impacting event that in my whole life, and it really shaped and formed the person that I became. So I think I always come back to that moment as a real crossroads of, I think my life would have been extremely safe if, if it hadn't happened. Um, but seeing, like having that take place, it really made me recalibrate and think, you know, I can't live for other people anymore. I have to just do the things that make me happy. And, um, and so from that point, I've sort of, that's why I'm in, in doing this, you know, writing shows and, and acting and being on radio. I mean, that's all the stuff that I would have wanted to, that I wanted to do when I was younger. And gradually the world sort of chips away at you and tells you, oh, it's too difficult. It's really hard to make it. You better have it secured. You know, you better have a fallback job. Make sure you go to university. Otherwise you you'll never have security. And, and. It's all just reasons. To, it's all just reasons to say no, you know, to, to to stop doing what you want to do. And so, when my mum passed away, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna do things that make me happy. I'm gonna try and achieve these things. And if I don't, well, at least I tried. And so, I'm really, I'm, you know, I guess that the crux of this book is a, is a kid who, who, you know, tries to capture happiness and take it to his mum as a cure for for her disease. And uh, I think that really sums up probably what I've been trying to do ever since, you know, in my real life. So what advice would you give to a young person who's wondering what they should do with their lives? What advice would you give them when they're not sure about who they are or what they want to do or who they want to be? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question, certainly when you're at that age. My advice is to trust your instincts and follow your dreams. I've got a few mantras. You have gotta be in it to win it, okay? Sure, I share that mantra with the gold lotto, but that is, that is, you have to be in it to win it. You have to do it, right? Although if you never even try, you will not, there's no chance of succeeding. Um, another thing I like doing is failing gloriously. Just set out to fail um, because you will always learn from it. And also failing is not as bad as you think it is. No one actually cares if you failed as long as you tried really hard. So, but come on, I mean, you walked onto a, you know, a stand-up comedy stage competition and won. You ended up being on Triple J as the Brecky announcer, yeah, one yeah. of the most prestigious <laughs> gigs. You've got your, created your own show, which is a big hit on Stan, and now you've got this great book. Come on. Yeah. Seriously, when have you spectacularly failed? But those are the things that no one sees the failing. That's the, that's the thing. You've got to fail. You've got to set out to fail because at the end of the day, no one even sees it. You know, people are so terrified of failing, but, it, but it, it's not a big deal if you fail, right? It's, uh, you have to fail so that you learn all the mistakes you make so that you can get it, so, so you can get what you actually want and set out. You know, you, you point out that I, you know, I've done the Melbourne Comedy Gala, you know, six years in a row or whatever, right? But you don't see all the terrible gigs that I do in front of 10 people where I bomb on stage, where the material doesn't work, but I have to try the material to see if it works before I can then go on TV and do it, you know, and, and have it be a success. Getting on Triple J, that was 10 years after I'd started this job, you know? I'd been doing comedy for, for almost 10 years. And so I'd done previous radio trials. I'd failed on shows before. I'd hosted a TV show that got canceled, you know? So I, I'd failed so much. Um, and it all, it's all just stepping blocks. The biggest thing that, that, that I have taken away from all of this, people ask you how to, how to you know, writing, writing books, writing TV shows and stuff like that. It, it's to not think of it like a TV show or not think of it like a book. 
if you think of it like a book, suddenly it, it becomes really overwhelming. So I try to think of everything I do as like, um, it sounds ridiculous, but like making a sandwich. Does the sandwich have chicken? <laughs> yeah, the, jam, the sandwich is jam packed and a bit of chicken salt. If you tell, if, if someone's hungry, right? And you say, oh, I'll make a sandwich. If you then spend hours fretting about whether the sandwich is going to be any good or not, and then you make a sandwich and it doesn't look right, it doesn't, oh, and then you take it apart, and then you make it, and it just, oh, it doesn't feel right, and you start judging yourself and stuff. That person will never be able to eat a sandwich that is not made, that's not finished, that doesn't exist, right? Whereas they can make, they can eat a sandwich that is just okay and be thankful that they've eaten it. And they'll probably be really appreciative of the fact that you made a sandwich. They won't necessarily think it's the best sandwich in the world, but they'll be like, well, you made it, I enjoyed it, thank you for that. And so whenever I make anything at all, I have to just remember that people are hungry. They just, they just wanna consume stuff. And, uh, and if I don't make the world's best sandwich right now, then I, it doesn't mean I have to stop making sandwiches or, or anything. I just, well, I think, oh, next time I'll, I'll figure out how to toast the bread a bit better or I'll, I'll grill the chicken a little bit, you know, m moister or whatever. And so, yeah, I, don't try and beat yourself up too much. That's really great food for thought. <laughs> it's given me a lot to chew on. <laughs> People often talk about the idea of, you know, comedy is tragedy plus time. How soon is too soon? And how does comedy help us, you know, deal with the tragic things that happen in our lives, like our mum's passing? I mean, everyone's, everyone's range is different. Parameters are different. I remember I made a joke the morning that my mum died. Um, we were driving uh, home from the hospital. My best friend had come and picked me up and we were driving back to his house and it was Good Friday. And I remember saying, oh, well, it's okay, because it's Good Friday, so I'm sure she's, she's gonna come back in three days, right? Now, I thought that was funny. They didn't laugh. They hadn't processed it. They, didn't, they, they felt uncomfortable. But I had thought, well, this is funny, and what else are we gonna do? Now, whether that's the right response to have, there's no right or wrong, but it's just that everyone is different in terms of when's too soon and when's not. What you have to be conscious of when you're making jokes about tragic things is to ensure that everyone who is affected by the said tragedy is also ready to make jokes. Um, because there might be people who are still really processing that whole experience and, uh, and aren't ready. And also, you want, to, you want to do justice. You want to be truthful and open and honest about the situation. Um, and look at, all the, look at all of the flaws and all of the difficulties and the struggle as well as all of the, the funniness that you get out of it. That's why the book goes up and it has ups and downs as well. I think jokes are really great if they balance out sincerity and, you know, levity. Um, if you have a tragic situation and all you do is joke about it, then people will start probably thinking that you are not acknowledging the real hurt that uh, you might have experienced. So it depends on how big the tragedy is. Usually the simple rule, the bigger the tragedy, the bigger the time. <laughs> right? That's, that's generally the rule. So, uh, so yeah, you stub your toe, well, you can probably joke about it tomorrow. But, um, you know, if your mum passes away, when you're 12 and it takes you a while to figure everything out, you might write a book about it 18 years later. Speaking of responses, and given that it is semi-autobiographical, I imagine there'd be a lot of people in the book who are based on people that you know. Um, how have they, the people in the book responded to the book, especially your dad? That's a tough one. Dad still gets annoyed about things that pop up in the book. My character does some um, pretty questionable things <laughs> involving his downstairs areas. Can I say that? <laughs> and, so what, the rumpus room? Yeah, 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 the basement of the building the that laundry, he lives in, yeah. yeah. Um, no, he does some query, very question, just interesting things when in regards to 
discovering his body and himself. And uh, they're embarrassing things. And, um, you know, my dad called me up the other day and <laughs> said, why would you say that you were doing that in the dental van that I worked in? And I said, no, it's not you, Dad. It's not you. It's a fictional character who also just happens to be Ghana and work at a dental, in a school dental van. Um, so, yeah, that's just a, that's a tough, it's a tough thing to have to straddle. You know, it's a line that you have to straddle. And also, for me, it was always about telling my character's story and never trying to tell someone else's story. So um, only ever being able to tell, talk about things that my character has seen through his eyes, through his perspectives, the things that have directly affected him and f formed him as a person. Um, you can't make judgments or, or um, you know, broad statements about other people that, that you don't know or don't affect you. That's kind of my rule. Everybody who sees you now would say, well, look at Matt O'Kahn, he's so cool, he's so successful. Would they? He seems to have it all together. <laughs> would they? <laughs> well, thank you if you say that. Would. How did you manage to capture the voice and the feelings of a 12-year-old kid who doesn't know what his place is, what he's going to do or who he's going to be, how he quite fits in, and coming to terms with not only the confusion that we all feel, you know, as we're going from primary school into high school and through puberty into adulthood, but also this big tragedy that's about to befall him. How did you tap into that, you know, from a perspective 18 years later? And how did it feel for you? The, my character in the book, Mike, is 12 years old and he's going through a lot of things in his life and the reason why I think people connect with this book, no matter what age they are, is because the things that he's going through are things that stick with us for our entire life. So he is self-conscious about parts of his body, but body image is one of the biggest, you know, anxiety inducing factors of, of, our, of everyone in the world. That's why the cosmetic industry is billions of dollars deep, you know, because we, we all care about how we look. I'm going bald right now. Look, going so bald. And I, you know, I'm self-conscious about that. So it, it's... I'm I, so jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know, I know what, you know, I know, I still know what it feels like to be, to have body image issues or to feel self-conscious about your body. Um, falling in love for the first time, you know. I, I mean, the thing about what, what, what Mike is going through is he's going through lifelong problems, problems that will always be with you, no matter how old you are, no matter who you are, for your whole life, he's just going through them for the first time. So, and that's what puberty is, you know, that's really what it is. It's basically ha starting to have all the problems that you will have for the rest of your life. So he wants to fit in, you know, he wants to, he wants to, um, he wants to have, find love. He wants a girl to like him, you know, everyone wants someone to like them, you know, but no matter how old you are, you'd st you can still find yourself um, crushing on someone or, 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 in, or in love and having unrequited love. And that's, that's something that'll be around forever, you know? So yeah, I, I just think that he's doing it for the first time and, and it wasn't difficult to tap into that at all. It's just finding different scenarios instead of the, the, the core emotion. So what advice would you give to 12 year old Matt, you know, in the week or two after his mum had died? Or to any 12 year old wanting to find their place in the world? The biggest thing for me as a young boy was definitely to understand your emotions, acknowledge your emotions. There was a real lack of um, communication, I think, around that when I was growing up. Um, and I mean, just from, from a societal point of view, you know, it was very much still that boys don't cry, boys are tough, blah, blah, blah. And it's just really, that sort of attitude is just really harmful. Um, and I pent up a lot of anger when I was young based on the kind of feelings of desertion that I had from my mum passing away that, you know, I sort of put up a big wall of, I don't want to, don't want anyone to hurt me again you know mum had really hurt me by dying so I don't want and no one else is ever going to hurt me and that was just 
a very negative approach to life. Um, it made me just angry and, you know, tense and I'd get into fights or I'd go to parties and stuff. And, you know, I just, it took me until I was 18 to finally cry, you know, to finally actually even cry about it all. Um, when I started drama school and that opened up a whole world of understanding of what all that anger is, you know, anger is just hurt. It's just vulnerability, but it manifests itself in an aggressive way instead of in an um, emotionally suppressive way, I guess, you know, crying inward. So I wish that I'd known now to tap into those emotions better and to acknowledge them and and be proud of vulnerability. I think guys don't realize that they can be they that that being vulnerable is a is a strong quality to have. It does take a lot of strength to be gentle and kind and vulnerable. What do you think 12-year-old Matt or Mike would say to you today if you could meet? Probably just want to borrow my computer if it has the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> Can I borrow a chip? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably what. There you go. <laughs> Thanks so much. That, Matt, Matt, look, before we oh, go... Oh, you take the biggest one, of course. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Leave me and with even these though it's got chicken salt on it. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me with these little ones. Look at this. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you pitch that off. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a world-famous comedian. You're a very funny man. I was working on a social distancing joke, but I only got this far. That's Matt O'Keefe. <laughs> These are his chicken and oh chips. It's oh kind. It's <laughs> I've got the yips now. I'm Sunil Badami. That was Matt O'Kine. These are his chips. And this was the Byron Writers Festival Digital School Session. Being Black and Chicken and Chips is published by Hashet Australia. And you can buy it from your local bookshop or from the Byron Writers Festival official bookseller, The Book Room at Byron, which you can find at thebookroomatbyron.com. Or maybe just convince your librarian to buy a copy or two for the library. Don't forget you can check out all the other great schools events and other fun stuff at the Byron Writers Festival at byronwritersfestival.com. And don't forget to check out the amazing work that the Story Factory does at storyfactory.org.au I should have known something was wrong as soon as I walked in. The shower was running and mum never had a shower until after dinner. She'd always said she didn't want to go to bed smelling like chops. I was actually glad she was in the shower though because it meant I could quickly run to my room and spray deodorant under my pits in an attempt to somehow erase the terrible conversation I'd had with Mr. Borte. I was running back down the hallway to let Dad know that I'd gotten in safely when I heard Mum. I don't think I'll ever forget that sound. Mike! She warbled through the white noise of the shower. The first time Mum didn't sound like Mum. I stopped and turned back towards the bathroom. I'd been super excited because I knew that there was an MA, and then in brackets, SN, movie on SBS that night, and I'd mentally been trying to figure out which cricket highlights video I'd be willing to tape over. But suddenly I was, I was scared. Really scared. I knocked on the bathroom door knowing I didn't need to. It was slightly ajar and I could hear mum moaning. When I eventually stepped in, I thought I'd been pranked because I couldn't see her. I could just see the steamed up glass of the shower screen, nobody on the other side. And then I looked down. Mum was sitting on the floor of the shower, completely naked. It had been years since I'd seen her naked. I used to hang out in her room all the time when she was getting changed or putting on creams and it was never a problem. But then a few years ago, she told me that I shouldn't see her naked anymore, that it wasn't appropriate. Now I was looking down at her, helpless. I turned my head and looked away. I wasn't really sure what she wanted. She had her head hung in her hand and the shower screen was slightly open. Water was splattering all over the tiles and starting to dribble past my feet onto the carpet in the hallway. I didn't want to touch her naked, so I just quickly turned off the shower taps. I handed her a towel from the rack and turned away from her again. My heart was racing. She didn't look good at all. Her eyes closed, her lips blue, slumped on the floor, now shivering. Is your dad still outside? She mumbled, barely audible. Oh, shit. I forgot. He was still waiting for me to let him know that I'd gotten in safely. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll give him the signal, I said as I turned to run out the bathroom door. Oh, no, no, she yelled, much louder this time. He, he needs to stay, she spluttered through wet lips. I, I think I need to go to the hospital. It took me a minute to compute everything, standing there looking at my naked mum, her pale, plump frame slumped on the floor of the shower, water trickling from the shower floor and out onto the carpet in the hallway. I thought about the dishes piled up in the kitchen sink, my dirty clothes in the laundry basket, and the smell, how much I smelled. It suddenly hit me, right through the mask of the deodorant. Mum was sick. And so I turned around, ran outside, and called for Dad. It's lucky I had a growth spurt recently. I'd just hit 165 centimetres and had finally surpassed Mum, a feat I'd been chasing for a few years now. I say it's lucky because if I hadn't been so big, I don't know how Dad and I would have carried her out the shower and out into the apartment building's elevator, past the letterboxes and across the street to the car. Dad was about to leave when I came running out, thinking that I'd forgotten to give him the signal. We'd wrapped Mum in a bedsheet because she couldn't dress herself. She said her head had hurt too much and she couldn't open her eyes. But by the time we'd made it to the car, she'd managed to lift one eyelid and she'd started to feel self-conscious being out in public in a sheet. I will just pretend you're going to the university toga party, I joked. But nobody laughed. We tried to bundle Mum into the back of Dad's car, but she started pushing. I feel better now, she groaned, her arms rigid against the doorframe of the back seat, suddenly strong enough to stop us from getting her inside. No, Anne, Dad said. We need to go to the hospital. If it's nothing, it's nothing. We can all laugh. But this could be serious. I just want to make sure you're okay. My jaw almost fell off. Mum and Dad had been divorced for five years. I could barely remember a time together when they weren't fighting. But in that one sentence, I got to see a nostalgic glimmer of love, of caring. It made me realise that they didn't always hate each other and that somehow, however many moons ago, there was once a lot of love between them. I thought about times that they must have spent together watching movies or going out to Dad's nightclub long before I came along and turned them into boring parents. They would have been young lovers once too, just like me and Zoe would hopefully one day be. Just when it looked like she wouldn't go anywhere without a fight, Mum's arm buckled and she fell into the back seat of the car, almost hitting her head on the opposite passenger door. She let out a moan and Dad twisted her legs so that they fully fit inside and he closed the door. He ran around the car to the driver's side and jumped in. I stood aside as I heard his car roar into life before speeding off only to stop about 10 metres away. Then the red reverse lights illuminated. Suddenly the car was back next to me again. Dad opened his door. He stuck his body out. He said, I'm sorry, I thought you were inside. God, you're hopeless sometimes, I said. Mike! Get in the bloody car.